Good afternoon and welcome to the third webinar in a series hosted by NASDAQ and Brown Flynn. My name is Marissa Bichuk, an Associate Consultant and Marketing titled How Human Capital Impacts Corporate Financial Performance. Our special guests for this webinar join us from Harvard Law School's Pensions and Capital Stewardship Project in the Labor and Work Life Program. A few logistics um, before we get started. So all participants are in listen-only mode during the presentation. At any time during the webinar, you can type a question into the question box and we will address it at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties during the webinar, please don't hesitate to contact either number you see on your screen. The agenda for today's webinar is as follows. Um, Evan Harvey, Director of Corporate Responsibility for NASDAQ, will welcome us in just a few moments and give introductions. Mike Wallace, Managing Director for Brown Flynn, will be our moderator today. And our special guests are Dr. Larry Bieferman and Aaron Bernstein with the Pensions and Capital Stewardship Project at Harvard Law School. And with that, I will turn it over to Evan for the welcome and introduction. Evan? All right, thank you very much. I want to welcome everybody to the latest quarterly uh, issuer facing webinar that NASDAQ has run for its uh, listed companies and other guests. These webinars traditionally focus on sustainability topics. Uh, we have gravitated towards the topic of environmental, social, and governance practice and disclosure at corporate reporters in the past. We're going slightly afield this time into an area that I think is definitely related, talking about human capital management, the intersection of more progressive HR policies and financial performance measurements. Um, we're very happy to have Larry and Aaron here from Harvard to discuss their research, which I find provocative and kind of groundbreaking. And if we can just get these facts into the hands of VPs and policy and benefits uh, builders at NASDAQ listed companies and other corporates, I think that uh, companies will be moving in the right direction. Uh, this sim seminar series, as I mentioned, is quarterly. It is a free benefit for NASDAQ listed companies. We try to put issuers in touch with the experts in the space in a variety of topics. We do this in other areas at the exchange as well, but this series is based on sustainability. Uh, um, in a couple of different uh, ways, NASDAQ is always looking to educate and engage with its listed company audience. So if there are suggestions for future events uh, related to this topic that you would like to make or experts that you feel would be suited to this uh, format, please, by all means, get in touch with me. Uh, Evan Harvey, Director of Corporate Responsibility at NASDAQ. I'm fairly easy to find. So I'm going to give a bit of an update on stock exchanges a little later in the program and how we're involved in this in other ways. But right now I'd like to turn it over to Mike Wallace, the uh, Managing Director at Brown Flynn, who will be moderating today's discussion. Mike? Thank you, Evan, and thanks to Larry and Aaron for being here with us today. It's great to have these two experts in a, in a particular area with us, and we're going to dive into their research uh, in a couple of minutes. And it's very timely because there's been some things that have been popping up in the marketplace too. But with that being said, I always want to give a little bit of a brief overview of what's going on. And for purposes of our, our recorded webinar today, what we do is um, record these materials for your use in the future, and you'll be uh, uh, able to have access to a recorded version uh, once we get through with the webinar. Marissa on the other side is driving the webinar for us, so we'll be asking her to, to change slides. And first slide, if you could move to the next slide, Marissa, that'd be great. What we're seeing in the marketplace is an increasing demand for sustainability across all portions of the economy. And what this graphic represents is the various people in the marketplace that are asking companies to be more transparent about sustainability. Um, for today's, particularly for today's discussion, we're going to talk about the investor activity and how much interest is coming from investor investors and on what type of topics. Probably the two biggest things that we're seeing out there is the investor activity raising more and more attention in the boardroom, at the investor relations office, and the CFO suite, but also customers are now demanding this of their suppliers. If I, as a, as a company, am going to be sustainable, then I need to understand the sustainability of my goods and services that I purchase. Next slide, Marissa. When we look at the investor community, we're seeing increasing number of investors group up into coalitions or initiatives out there. This is just a sample of some of the latest ones, and that Larry and Aaron may talk about these in more, more detail in a couple of minutes. But in essence, what these, the common factor here, most of them are looking at carbon-related issues or greenhouse gas-related risks, 
most of them are representing large groups of investors who then represent large amounts of capital. What we're also seeing with things like the PRI and the, the UN Guiding Principles and Reporting are going beyond that area of greenhouse gases and carbon. They're looking at the broader range of sustainability issues. If we go a little further with the next slide, it's not just these large groups and their asset owners and asset managers that are signing on. There's a, a food chain that's evolved here. In the lower left corner, we see some of the traditionally well-known, recognized SRI community, the Socially Responsible Investment Funds. Over the course of time, up in the right-hand corner, they've gotten the attention of state-owned public pension plans. Public pension plans have suppliers, and those suppliers are in this middle swath from left to right. All of these entities on here today are PRI signatories. They have publicly committed to doing more in the way of looking at their portfolios across a broad swath of sustainability issues. The next slide shows you what kind of information they might be reading when they're looking through all of the companies in their portfolios. So right now in today's society, in today's marketplace, we're seeing a wide range of phrases used by companies to explain what they're doing. So if you were doing your own due diligence as an investor, you have your own pension plan, so you might be looking at a particular company and you're interested in sustainability. You would go to their website and you would see companies phrasing things like this. It's still a voluntary space, so they can call this whatever they want. In the U.S., if they were reporting on annual performance, financial performance, they would be calling that something like a 10K or an annual financial report. In the sustainability or corporate responsibility world, here are just some of the phrases that we're seeing out there in the marketplace. The next slide helps us look at the broader aspects of sustainability. This comes from the Global Reporting Initiative, which is the most widely used sustainability reporting framework in the world. It's being written in the national laws in different parts of the world. It's being integrated into stock exchange listing guidelines and requirements. And companies are now demanding that suppliers produce a GRI report. GRI has been around for 20 years and has basically been reaching out to the world's interested parties and asking everybody out there that wants to be a part of it, what do you think are important issues for organizations to report upon? And so this is the brainstorm from the world's um, interested parties in sustainability. So it's not just the environmental bucket in the, up, in the, up in the upper left. A variety of other things that some can be easily quantified, some cannot be easily quantified. So we get a lot of qualitative statements that come out. Um, so when you look at this and you think about today's discussion on human capital, we're going to be probably focusing more in the upper right and the center columns here. How do we, how is an organization with four walls, employees, and a footprint that buys goods and services, how is that organization impacting people? The next slide goes into how we can make sense of this world. If you're a company, a NASDAQ listed company on this call today and you've never heard of these issues or you're just starting to get some crazy questions in your inbox, just be aware that there's a, a plethora of things going on out there. It may seem really complicated at first, but actually many of these things can work on your behalf. On the left-hand side are the range of reporting frameworks that are out there. You should look at these as a company as your roadmap to success. These are experts in the field that have been thinking through these issues for a long time. As nonprofit entities, they're generally reaching out to a wide range of stakeholders and getting a lot of opinions involved in their work. And then they're passing on their great work to you to use. You don't have to use them, but you might want to turn to them. Some of these you might recognize, some of you you've never seen. For those of us that are in the sustainability field, these are things that we talk about regularly. In the center are the research firms. If I want to understand the performance of a portfolio or an index, let's say I want to try to figure out the sustainability performance of the entire S&P 500, do I want to sit down and read 500 sustainability reports? There aren't even 500 sustainability reports in the S&P 500. I'd have to go to their websites. I'd have to go look at certain areas. I'd probably have to look at some brochures. Maybe they mention something in their annual report. In the center are some unique entities out there in the world that are doing some great work at digging through all the details for you. If you're a company, you probably already have subscriptions to some of these services. If you're a company, you're probably also seeing some of these things in your inbox, or your CFO has probably come to you recently and said, hey, why aren't we in this system, or why is this system, this entity, saying this about us? And on the right-hand side, everyone loves to be on great lists, the top company. Everyone hates to be on the bad lists. Think about how you make your own decisions to go to a movie or a restaurant. 
same thing is happening here in a parallel universe in sustainability. People love to be Fortune's most admired. People love to be on Diversity Inc.'s uh, list. People like to be recognized as the safest place to work. Again, something we'll talk about a little bit more detail here in a couple of minutes. And next, we move into the stock exchange place. And this is where I'm going to pass it back to Evan. Uh, he and I have been working together on these webinar series for a few months, no more than a year now. But we've also been involved with the UNEP, uh, UN's initiative on sustainable stock exchanges. So I'm going to let Evan just update us on WFE and the UN's work. Evan, back over to you. So thanks, Mike. Uh, of course, you just saw the previous few slides. The stock exchanges are involved, just like a lot of other entities are involved. We're involved for a couple of reasons. One is because in our business, we have an interest, a financial interest, in creating and maintaining listings or listed companies that are going to be viable well into the future. It's uh, financially prudent for us to uh, do whatever we can to support those listings and to keep them um, out competing their, uh, their peers and competitors for years to come. So we believe that ESG and sustainability criteria uh, play into that and are definitely a part of the financial picture for listed companies as we move into the future. Um, a number of uh, you might know about the two parallel initiatives that are out there right now. The UN-backed Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative has 21 members, including a number of large and small exchanges around the world. Uh, I chair the working group at the, the sustainability working group at the World Federation of Exchanges, which is the only trade association that binds all the exchanges on the planet together, with one notable exception, that would be London. Um, but London is a participant in the UNSSC. And between these two initiatives, which are working towards similar goals, which is uh, uh, creating more transparency for investors around ESG and working with issuers to facilitate disclosure of environmental, social, and governance performance metrics, among other things like financial product development, index creation, et cetera. Um, these two uh, projects have sort of reached uh, an apotheosis here lately. We have, uh, in the last few weeks, released model guidance for stock exchanges through the UN project, and the WFP will release its recommendation to stock exchanges in October. So uh, traditionally, some stock exchanges have pr preferred to uh, engage on sustainability via a listing rule. They will require their listed companies to disclose information in certain areas quote, non-financial information. Uh, NASDAQ and NYSD in London, a lot of the larger, more competitive IPO exchanges have um, used a uh, engage and inform approach, a voluntary opt-in approach more often. And uh, we find that that has been successful as well. So uh, exchanges everywhere are working with regulators and responding to investor pressures to facilitate better data in the mix. And uh, these are some of the ones on this slide here that have been the most involved for the longest amount of time. NASDAQ has definitely been at the forefront and uh, will continue to do so, but in a way that uh, serves the business needs of our listed companies uh, first and foremost. Back to you, Mike. Great, Evan. I'm going to have a couple of questions for you about that. You've kept uh, us abreast of this over the course of these webinar series, but. Uh, um, I've Always the BM and F Bovespa, the Brazilian stock exchanges, approach to be rather interesting and unique. Uh, from what I recall, what they did initially was make a statement publicly about the fact that they were interested in these issues. They felt that sustainability, certain sustainability topics were material. Uh, from my recollection, they did their own sustainability report and did so according to GRI. I think they then moved into integrated reporting themselves, so in, in essence, walking the talk. Um, and then they started to basically list all of the list listed companies' websites where there was a sustainability disclosure. In essence, showing public information that was already out there, not picking on anyone or saying someone's good or bad, but just putting that right on their website. Are you aware of that story, and is that true, and can you elaborate any more on what Bovespa is doing and, and how the WFE feels about what they've done? Yeah, I think that's fairly true, and I think that's been the trajectory of a lot of exchanges as they come to maturity in the space. Basically, leading by example, by the most, most exchanges are public companies and uh, have reporting of their own to do. So they lead by example by getting involved in that and reporting their own performance in this area. Uh, posting information, education, engaging with their listed companies, publishing lists, as you mentioned, of the outperformers in the space so that investors have easy access to information when it comes to, I want to invest in the Brazilian exchange and this is a concern of mine, which companies do I turn to first? save me some trouble as I do my research. Um, that's been, and then, you know, they have 
moved to the point now where it's a listing rule related to uh, continuing to stay a member of the of the exchange. You have to disclose certain environmental, social, and governance factors around your performance on an annual basis. Uh, that's been the trajectory there, and and it's been the the timeline for a lot of other exchanges. Some, you know, like Johannesburg, who are coming out of a very particular historical situation, uh, work very closely with the regulator. They're very closely tied to government uh, governmental agencies. They came up with a standard via the King Code and basically made it required from day one, more or less. So uh, some exchanges uh, have the wherewithal and and the the uh, particular dynamics in their market to go that direction. A lot of exchanges are uh, getting to a rule by going from a education and outreach perspective to a rule. NASDAQ, NYSE, London, and a lot of other exchanges have been working more towards um, educating and informing issuers about the outperformance aspects of uh, doing well in this area. So I'll just leave it there, Mike. That's great, Evan. Thanks a lot. You get a little little bit of feedback on your phone, but we're, we heard you quite well. Um, so with the next slide, what we want to do is start to get us into the human resources, human capital point of view. Um, as we talked about, lots of companies are measuring, managing, and reporting on sustainability performance. Um, sustainability performance is not just the environmental piece. It's also about how you treat people around your offices, around your facilities, around your suppliers' facilities, etc. but also how you're treating the people that you employ. There are large associations out there. We just heard about the World Federation of Exchanges. That's a group of like-minded entities that get together. Well, in the world of human health and safety, there are some very large organizations that are looking at these issues as well. The Center for Safety and Health Sustainability is a fairly new organization. It represents over 100,000 occupational safety and health professionals, and this group itself is trying to figure out what are the best key performance indicators that their profession should be measuring to help companies understand the value of treating their employees well. So this is an interesting dynamic. CSHS and all the organizations underneath are global entities that are working on these issues together, and they're pushing their ideas up to those reporting frameworks that we mentioned earlier. In fact, they're in direct dialogue with the Global Reporting Initiative about what kind of metrics should be included in the next version of the GRI guideline. The next slide is something that Larry and Aaron pointed out to me in our last call. I didn't recognize this story had popped up, but, but it just came out in the Wall Street Journal not too long ago. Uh, I just plucked out a few statements that I thought were interesting there. I don't want to um, give any specific applause to any of the statements. It's just the article and the way it was written. But the very last point here, this meta-analysis of 92 studies is what we're going to talk about right now with, with Larry and Aaron. And Aaron. And these, these two experts are going to take us on a deeper dive into what all this means and how it relates back to in, investors and, and, and the stock exchanges in general. So the next slide, Marissa, our speakers today are Aaron Bernstein, report and co-author of this research, senior research fellow for the Pensions and Capital Stewardship Project at Harvard Law School, and Dr. Larry Bieferman, who's a report and co-author as well. With that, I'm going to pass the baton over to Larry and Aaron, and uh, Marissa will move to the next slide and work with you all. So that you all know on the line, we, uh, as I mentioned, we're recording this, but we also have the platform set up where you can write in questions to us. So please feel free. We'll see it on our end. We'll bring that up when and where appropriate. You'll all be on mute throughout this. Um, so please do chime in with questions through the messaging and chat functions. Over you, gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mike. So this is uh, Aaron Bernstein. Um, so as uh, Mike and uh, Evan have been saying, um, sustainability issues, uh, sometimes called uh, ESG issues, have been of increasing concern to investors. Um, the sort thanks, of the phrase that, that we use is, uh, oh, thanks, thanks, Marissa. Um, ESG as uh, you can see there stands for environmental, social, and governance issues, which is a way of, for investors and companies to talk about issues that um, are of uh, material importance uh, in the sustainability field. And Larry and I have done um, a number of papers on this topic trying to help investors, pension funds, and others get a handle on social factors, which by and large have um, not been covered very well. Um, there's been a, a lot of research on corporate governance and a growing amount of research on environmental factors. Um, social factors have been much less studied. Um, the one 
signal perception of that is the topic of this paper, which is uh, human capital factors, which is sort of a jargony word that economists use for human resources, um, um, such as training and, and other uh, human resource policies. Um, so, um, I'm Marissa Queen, the next slide. Um, basically, what we we were aware of this literature, in fact, it's, it's been sort of a cottage industry, particularly in the U.S. and um, the U.K. for some decades with academics and practitioners and consultants studying companies and their human resource policies. And we thought from the investor standpoint that what we would do would, would be to pull out ones that were considered uh, material under um, you know, SEC definitions because that's a sort of most concern to investors. So there, there have been hundreds and hundreds of studies on these topics and we we excluded those that looked at issues like productivity and others and tried to find correlations to corporate outcomes that weren't directly about financial performance. Um, so what we did is we just looked for standard investor metrics, you know, TSR, ROE, ROI, and we looked at studies that used those kinds of metrics to analyze corporate performance. Um, next slide, please, Marissa. And, um, uh, you know, what we found was, um, you know, that most studies, uh, you know, they tend to do what's sort of standard in, in economics, which is uh, regression analysis and some link sort of more directly to stock prices. Um, there have been studies on this topic of, of human resource policies in dozens of countries around the world. Um, about half the ones that we found that, that looked at uh, the corporate financial performance as we defined it were done in the U.S. and the U.K. where this has uh, been uh, of most concern, although it's possible that uh, we restricted our um, research to the English language, so we probably missed many in other countries. Uh, next slide, please, here. So here you can see, you know, sort of our broad-based summary um, analyzing the studies that we found, uh, these 92 studies. Um, you know, we broke it down into training and basically all other human resource policies, and we did that, you know, it doesn't conceptually make a whole lot of sense because training is a human resource policy, but we did that because that's what researchers have done over the years. Training has been such a specific policy that has been found to lead to higher and better corporate performance that has become a sort of a subcategory of research. Um, so as you can see, um, most of these studies, uh, what we try to do is pick out the one sort of primary finding, because a lot of academic studies have multiple findings, but we tried to pick out the one that the researchers, the authors of the studies, identified as, as primary whenever we could. Um, most of them were positive. Some of them were, actually, let's go, go back for one second to that slide, you'll see there was a um, mixed category, and basically what that means is the findings were, they had a positive finding, but they also had finding that either they found no correlation to, between a human resource or training policy and, and a, some kind of um, financial metric, or they found a negative one. Most of them were sort of no correlation. Um, but so overall, um, you, you know, the vast majority of the findings in this field were that human resource policies, better human resource policies lead to higher corporate performance. Um, now we go to the next slide. Thanks, Marissa. Um, so, um, well, I already explained how we uh, we looked at training separately because that's what uh, basically the research does. There is some overlap there. Some of the uh, human resource policy studies included training as well. Um, we tried to separate them as best we could. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, you know, to start with training, um, the, the sort of general theory of its relationship to corporate performance is pretty straightforward, um, which is if you offer training to employees, you know, you enhance their knowledge, their skills, their abilities, um, and if you have uh, employees who can perform their jobs better, they're going to be more productive, they're going to, um, uh, you're going to see better uh, product and service quality, and you're going to have more um, satisfied customers. Uh, that in turn leads to higher sales and profitability and, and stock returns. Um, it's difficult to study those things because those are, you know, it's sort of conceptually that's a pretty clear chain of logic, but when you try to tie it down with numbers, it, it gets to be difficult. Uh, and it's even more difficult because 
there's sort of broadly speaking two kinds of training. One is which is sort of general, um, and you sort of train somebody how to how to do uh, you know how to be a better worker. And the other is very specific about here's this machinery or this process. Um, here's what you're supposed to do on this particular job. And the papers that we looked at have studied both of those kinds of uh, training. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so mostly the way um, companies measure training um, is you, you know through how much they spend um, and the research sort of covers the gamut they you know academics and others have looked at how much companies spend per employee per firm as a percent of payroll they also look at training policies you know what kind of policies there are what they say and also what percent of the workforce is trained and how much time is spent on that. Um, and all these measures give you a way to sort of capture the value that training brings to uh, a corporation. Um, just so, sort of one example of the dozens of studies was uh, one that um, was done in 2004 that looked at U.S. companies over a, a two-year period and they found that um, the top quartile of those who spent more per employee had 31 percent higher annual stock price returns. Uh, sorry, they averaged 31% annual stock price returns, whereas the bottom quartile averaged 15%. Um, so, um, as I said before, training is one kind of HR policy um, that was sort of has been lumped into a specific category. So, all the other kinds of HR policies that we looked at in the other papers cover the kinds of things you see here: compensation and benefits, job and work design. Uh, training, obviously, recruitment, employee relations, communications, promotions. There's sort of a whole range of policies that have been studied by academics. And initially, when this sort of field of study got going, um, which was actually back in the 60s and 70s, um, researchers looked at a specific policy. And then after a while, they realized, well, that's not really how the world works. Companies have combinations of policies. You don't just have a compensation policy or a training policy. They work in tandem. Um, and so around the mid-1990s, uh, most experts in this field um, started thinking about what academics call bundles of policies, um, which are um, a way of talking about how companies that have a range of policies that interact with each other. and. You, some of you may remember that in the 1990s was a time when the, a lot of U.S. corporations, particularly manufacturing, were worried about competition from the Japanese. Um, and there came to be a phrase called high performance work systems that was essentially another way of talking about bundles of HR policies. Um, so the, 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 one of the, the seminal findings, uh, you know, studies in this field um, that sort of kicked off this high performance work system one was they looked at uh, nearly a thousand U.S. firms with 100 more employees and found positive relations to um, both Tobin's Q and return on capital employed from a bundle of high-performance work system policies, and that really set the field off uh, and started a lot of research in this in, in, in terms of groups or, or bundles of policies. Um, so overall, as I said, and you saw in that initial uh, table. Um, the research has shown that companies that have better kinds of policies, training and resource policies, uh, perform better than peers who don't. Um, having said that, there's um, you know a lot of um, difficulties and limitations. The first one, obviously, is do the better policies cause the better performance, or you know, are companies who are wealthier and can afford to pay their employees training costs, you know? they perform better because they're already performing better and they train more. Um, the academics, as you can imagine, have worried about that issue a lot over the years and they've done a lot, lots of kinds of studies about causality and um, these kinds of policies and for the most part the conclusion is what you would expect which is good policies um, lead to better performance and not the other way around. There's still some debate about that issue but by and large that seems to be the conclusion of most of uh, the research. Um, and uh, the other big issue, which is, is, is a real difficulty for investors as um, and, and corporations is, okay, you need bundles of policies, 
that work well um, to have a better performing company. Well, which bundles exactly? Which policies do we need? Is, um, and, and that's difficult. That's difficult to say. It varies by industry. Um, it can vary by company strategy. Um, you know, people have long compared Costco and Walmart. You know, there are different sort of segments of the same retail industry. They have very different human resource policies. Um, so you might need a policy that fits your company's strategy and your industry. Uh, and from an investor standpoint, that makes it difficult to, to sort of figure out how to assess companies uh, and their policies because they need a narrative. They need to understand what the company is doing and, and what their business and, and HR strategy is and, and see if it makes sense relative to peers. Um, you know, the last issue is uh, sort of an academic one, really, which is how exactly do uh, policies um, that are better link to performance? You know, is it that sort of chain of logic to, you know, better armed employees lead to better product quality, better productivity, better customer satisfaction? So which exactly is it or which combination? And that's been um, something that's sort of difficult to pin down. Um, but overall, um, you know, the conclusion that we came to is there is um, more than enough evidence for investors to uh, conclude that companies who have better training in HR policies are likely to perform better. And in fact, really, if you you know, if you think about it, a, a lot of sort of mainstream financial metrics haven't been this studied. Um, th this topic has been looked at in depth by hundreds of academics. Uh, all over the world. Um, and investors have, you know, one of the reasons we decided to do this study was because we've worked a lot with investors at, at the Larry's Pensions Project. And while there's things like that Wall Street Journal article, which are relatively new, and we know those people and have worked with them, by and large, investors, don't re they don't really seem to be aware of the, the, the relationship between, you know, human capital policies and better financial outcomes. Um, so, you know, the conclusion that we came to is that um, investors increasingly know they need this kind of information. Companies need to do a better job of describing it to them um, and, and publicly reporting on it. Um, and some of that is pretty easy. Metrics on training are pretty straightforward. Um, most of that is um, actually not numbers, it's HR policies and the corporation's business strategies, which you know companies can report on and, and sometimes do, but not very well. Most of that kind of information is uh, collected internally by large corporations. A lot of good a lot of companies use KPIs to track their human resource policies, both the implementation and the impact on on outcomes like customer satisfaction. But they don't uh, report it publicly. Um, and part of that is some, maybe some sensitivity to, uh, you, know, um, you know, exposing yourself competitively. But mostly it seems to us like it's been a lack of demand on the investor side. They haven't really been asking companies for this kind of information, and that's probably partly because they didn't realize it was as material as uh, it's evident that it is. Um, so, you know, to, our conclusion from the data was that uh, there's an opportunity for companies who have good you know, human capital policies to present their story and accompanying data to investors. Um, and our um, impression is that there are more investors who would be uh, interested in that kind of data. Um, so having said that, um, I think we can um, open it up to any questions. Well, I have some comments, Aaron. Please, OK. Yeah, hi, this is uh, Larry Beefman. And just a few, uh, I'll call it a gloss on uh, 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 Aaron's presentation. Uh, first, I just want to uh, say that, I mean, clearly the focus of our paper was on materiality, uh, on investors very much caring about how HR policies bear on company financial performance. Uh, that being said, uh, the reality is that there are investors, and we as a personal matter, who are concerned about those policies for uh, normative reasons, whether ones of fairness, justice, or, or otherwise, uh, uh, and uh, some among them are uncomfortable even with the use of the word uh, human capital in part for that reason. But that being said, we think there are many instances in which doing well and doing good can be closely al aligned. Uh, a second point, 
quite obviously from what Aaron has described in the paper, there are a wide range of industries and sectors and companies within them with quite different workforces and diverse ways in which various kinds of workers uh, are critical to the success of those companies. Uh, and then perhaps uh, it is then not surprising that though most studies point to the importance to company performance of clusters of synergistic HR policies uh, tailored to their particular business strategies, the studies themselves are all over the map as to precisely which ones are relevant and precisely why. Uh, the studies, uh, in my view, fall short in that way, in part for the very reason we're having this webinar, because there isn't enough disclosure to enable academics and <coughs> practitioners, for that matter, to offer in the public realm to investors uh, and others a better gauge of <clears throat> what works uh, and why. Uh, third, uh, in, in my sense, uh, and excuse me, in any case, in my sense, uh, one of the ways to move ahead is to have a focused and in-depth dialogue with respect to particular industries or segments thereof about what is, uh, what is needed. Uh, that being said, uh, perhaps training related policies might be the one area where broadly applicable standards or criteria for disclosure might be most meaningful, at least for, for starters. Uh, in part, the extensive literature on training, which we've cited, uh, and which is indicative of that fact. Uh, of course, uh, as the paper suggests, uh, uh, even if there is meaningful standardized reporting uh, as to the what of training, it has to be accompanied by an informative narr narrative as to what for uh, and why. And I think we can turn to questions now. Hey, this is Evan from NASDAQ. I just wanted to jump in with one before we get to everybody else. Uh, for Aaron and Larry, to what extent is the, um, pro the, the probable lack of transparency around corporate policy disclosure, if uh, HR policies or bundles of policies are known or not known publicly, is that an inhibitor in this kind of research, not having a very good cross sample because a lot of companies keep that stuff uh, behind closed doors? You know, it, it presents several full problems from the point of view of, uh, of researchers. We've got to have the data in order to do the analyses, and I think as we remark in the paper, uh, uh, in mo most of the, uh, the studies rely uh, not on you know, some publicly reported information, but on specially arranged uh, surveys of, uh, of one or more uh, 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 people at, at various uh, companies. So they're heavily dependent on what, it, what functionally is a special form of, of private disclosure. So that's an obstacle. And um, we try to sort out practitioner reports, management consulting firms and related ones, but uh, perhaps for obvious reasons, uh, uh, they only offer you a, a few details about how they do and, and what the results are. So that, that is clearly an obstacle for academic study and ultimately an obstacle for investors. Um, actually, this is Aaron, if I can just chime in here as well. One of the good things about this is uh, if you look at all these uh, uh, studies that we've examined, as Larry said, virtually every one of them was dependent on the uh, a survey that was sent out to corporations. And the good news is that companies, even though they don't publicly report on this, I mean thousands and thousands of companies are in virtually every market have been willing to respond. So it's not really like there's a big secret here. Um, companies are willing to publicly disclose this kind of information by and large. Um, they just haven't really been asked in any systematic way. It's not required by regulators. It's not required by stock exchanges. Investors, as I said, they don't really systematically, they certainly have not asked it in a systematic way. Um, but I, I don't think it's a big problem with companies not wanting to, to, to you know, it's not a big company secret by and large. Um, there just hasn't been a sort of critical mass of people coming together saying we need to do this on the company side, the investor side, the regulator side. Yeah, I asked the question because, you know, you worry about the self-selecting bias. You know, the companies that do manage to put this into the public sphere are the outperformers because they have policies in place that tend to be better than others. And maybe the ones that do not have the policies in place are keeping them hidden for a reason. Or, as we suggest in the in the analysis uh, for today, is it, are they treating it as a competitive advantage or disadvantage to disclose this, this kind of information? But I have a quick question for Mike, uh, if we can get him back on the phone, and then I'll, I'll be quiet and let everybody else chime in. Um, if investors, if per Larry and, and Aaron, investors really are asking companies for this HR data, you work with corporate clients all the time in a variety of engagement roles, how burdened 
importance and do you think this would be for companies to provide do you think this is a costly ask Do you think this is that uh, issue? How broadly do you define that? How far are you going with the quote HR policies? And when you mentioned other HR policies, does it include aspects of training and, and how far do you go? Or how did you kind of reel it in and narrow the scope? Uh, well, this is Larry. This, just to respond, it, uh, if, the, if the people on the call will, if you go, when you go to the report on page uh, 31 to 32 of the report, we have a table for types of HR policies. and I. I can't count, but I would say there's probably, uh, you know, about 10 broad categories and, and something on the order of 50 to 60 types of policies within them. And so, so uh, that's indicative of the, of the breadth of, of policies that uh, researchers, academic and arguably practitioners have, uh, uh, have, have looked at. So, that's a reflection of what we saw. We didn't come up with them ourselves, but that's in fact what's been canvassed in the uh, uh, in the field. In fact, um, this is such a well-studied field. There was a paper in 2013 that went through and looked at all the different kinds of <laughs> thousands and so hundreds of studies, um, which is actually what we drew, drew that table from. Um, Great. Thanks for that response. Another question came in regarding rating agencies. Um, there are the, the rating agencies that we all well know very well, like the S&Ps and the Moody's of the world and the Fitches. What's going on um, with your work around some of these ESG or sustainability ratings agencies or others? Are they coming to you and asking you about what you've done and, and pushing more on companies for more disclosure? Um, Larry, you want to answer that? Or yeah, you please to, do. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so, I mean, as, as you know, Mike, there's maybe 100 plus um, ESG research data houses around the world. There's four or five big ones. Um, there's a lot of local regional ones. Most of them have um, been building in um, social factor data, including human resource and human um, and training kind of policies. Um, it's been pretty haphazard. They're definitely interested. We've had discussions with um, uh, a number of the big ones on this topic. And in fact, one of the, our, the next project Larry and I are thinking about doing is partnering with one of those uh, one of the ESG research houses to benchmark reporting on HR, because we think there's enough out there that you could do good initial benchmark of like the largest 2,000 global corporations. Journal article two, two weeks ago talked about this human capital working group in the US. As a group of investors who are 
question. Point. It's more business. They, they want to supply their customers who are the big investors, you know. So yes, they're. Responsible investment. They have various collaborations going um, amongst their member signatory investors on policies related to this. Uh, the uh, International Corporate Governance Network has also done work in this area, um, less so than the PRI, but they work on it. So, yeah, there's an, and then there's a number of sort of ad hoc investor groups, and then there's leading investors around the world that have been pushing on this increasingly. So, in the US, one of the you know, the most prominent sort of uh, activist type investors, not activist in terms of shareholders, but in terms of ESG is, is uh, Caliper, is California Public Employees Pension System. Uh, they came up with a set of investment beliefs uh, last year, um, and their four top goals, one of them was human capital from the resource factor, so they have pushed hard on this, as have a variety of um, uh, European funds, particularly the Dutch, um, the PGGM and, and uh, APG are two giant Dutch uh, pension funds that have been very active in this space. Uh, so in Norges Bank Investment Management. Um, so yeah, there's been a variety of, uh, of players on the investment side who have been basically mostly demanding more data. That's really what they've been asking. Ask for specific kinds of policies that they want companies to put in place, but at this point, mostly it's about reporting and data. Yeah. The follow-on to that, which is also coming up in some of these questions that are coming in, um, related to the types of information that's coming up. Um, you know, it, it'll be the big catastrophes that raise awareness about things. But what are the good practices that you're seeing, or that you've seen, and if you're able to name any? Companies that you've really surprised by, or if you can't name the company, just to, to give us some examples of best practices. Um, yeah, uh, well, obviously, um, as we said, training is probably the one that's the easiest to you know sort of get a handle on. Um, and there have been uh, yeah, there have been different companies singled out on albums. I don't think I've Really have an example of good companies. There have been the, the um, Britain has had a, a program, a government sponsored program to foster training and uh, programs amongst corporations. Um, and they have actually um, uh, done a pretty good job of, of singling out companies and, and helping. Well, they, they rate companies on their uh, training policies. Um, training is probably one of, the e one of the easiest to say companies are doing better here. I mean, having said that, again, it sort of depends on the company's strategy and the, the, the sector that they're in, because it's sort of necessary, more necessary to train employees in some sectors than in others. Um, but that's a place where um, companies, you know, it's fairly clearly tied to expenditures. Um, you know, so companies that spend more on training and train more of their employees overall tend to perform better. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a pretty easy correlation. When you start getting into compensation policies and all these other kinds of policies uh, in other aspects of HR, you know, you can't really say, well, we think companies should have you know, promotions from within and a stock option program or something. It really depends on the strategy. That's what this whole bundle concept is. It's very useful. You can say, well, best practices, whatever, you know, to have uh, independent directors on, on a corporate board. And it's pretty easy, it's pretty objective. This is more, you know, it's a, that kind of thing should be more or less true for most corporations having independent directors. That seems fairly well established. Human resource policy is not that clear cut and easy. It's more specific to industries and companies and markets. Yeah. Larry, you're fading a little bit in and out. It might be I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'll move closer, yeah. Yeah, an air.
Aaron, too, you a little bit, just make sure when you're talking you get right into the phone if possible. Um, okay. So, again, feel free to chime in with your questions. We're getting a few um, additional ones in here. I want to tur turn back to Evan, though. From a NASDAQ point of view, you do your own sustainability reporting. You look at these issues on behalf of the organization itself. Um, but more broadly, is there much going around on, on around, you know, beyond NASDAQ with the other exchanges around these types of issues? Uh, no, frankly, uh, Mike, to, to a large extent. Um, you know, we have been guided in our uh, reporting at NASDAQ and our work on the sustainability working group and the exchange recommendation by uh, prevalent players in the space like the GRI. GRI does a pretty good job of capturing a lot of HR metrics, but certainly not the diversity of the kinds of policy metrics that Larry and Aaron have studied in their in their work. So, you know, perhaps there's a shortfall there in terms of uh, not only what we disclose as a public company, but more importantly, you know, the recommendation that we're coming up with for exchanges when it comes to some of the social performance metrics. I mean, we have been focusing more on risk mitigation type things uh, and also uh, diversity, gender, and inclusion, uh, human rights policy, et cetera. Um, you know, the, the focus has generally been on that and uh, as sort of the, the more prevalent first generation sustainability metrics, but I think your, your point is well taken. There's probably room for and a need for more of a nod to HR policy as uh, not only risk mitigation factor, but also sort of a, a potential recruit and retain tool and revenue generation piece. So we're going to take a fresh look at this based on the, the work that Aaron, Aaron and Larry have done. Great. Thanks for that. We have a question that came in about coaching in general. There's a, a lot of coaching that goes on as CEOs, but through your research, Aaron and Larry, did you come across much in the way of coaching of management level or lower down levels of an organization? Does that come up at all? Uh, it comes up somewhat, yeah, mostly in the in the context of training, um, and their their most, most coaching is um, it's been done as as um, for amongst uh, managers rather than sort of lower down line workers. Um, there's been some studies of that which find that um, the more you coach, it's like a form of training basically. Uh, the it tends to bring better outcomes. Um, so it's a it's a fairly narrow piece uh, because it doesn't typically apply to that much of a company's workforce, especially big corporate workforce. Um, but it is certainly um, can be a competitive advantage, absolutely. Also, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron. I think it's investors and people, the UK group. Yes. In terms of the, the, who are on one hand looking at, at the uh, human capital broadly, but in terms of their rating of companies. One piece of that is, in fact, uh, the uh, the affirmative act and role that corporate leadership or senior leadership, their their ability to grasp, engage in, and sustain uh, the human capital policies. That that, in fact, is part of their own evaluation. I would call it a coaching, but certainly they see that as 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 as, as critical to how they characterize companies that are effective in that sphere. Great. Thanks for that. Um, so we're getting close to the end here. Um, Larry and Aaron, I guess the question that really stands out is, you know, uh, what are the key takeaways here for companies? What should they be aware of? We're primarily the audience today are more corporations that are NASDAQ listed companies. However, we have a good mix of academics, and NGOs, investors on the line too. If you were to break it down into those different audiences, what would you tell them uh, that they should take away from today's webinar? Want to start, Aaron, and I'll pick up. Yeah, that. sure. Um, well, certainly for for um, corporations and particularly the people in the uh, HR field, um, if you have Aaron, a, start, a little hard to hear. If you could no, I'm little sorry. Little okay, I'll see if I can talk more into the microphone here. If you have a story to tell uh, on your HR policies, that that's a story you should tell both to investors and to senior management. Um, and you know if. If companies underappreciated senior management doesn't understand the relationship between HR policies and better corporate performance, they need education on these uh, on these studies as well. Uh, um, I think there's a competitive advantage to being able to tell that kind of story to the public, to investors in particular, um, but uh, you know, re reporting at large, and that's something that companies um, again, a lot, especially big global corporations, they have a lot of metrics on this stuff. 
and they don't present it publicly, and that's an opportunity that um, is being missed. Um, so that would be my advice for companies and for investors. Uh, it seems obvious they should ask for more of these kinds of information. Um, if they want to invest in the better companies, that's one way to, to do it. It's a, it's a, there's a, lot, a long track record here of, of corporate outperformance based on HR policies. Uh, Larry, anything you want to? Yeah, well, I would say a couple things. One is uh, again, as, as I think, uh, I can. We have at the rhetorical level that uh, empl uh, employees or workers or companies' greatest uh, asset, and if in, if indeed that does have content, and obviously uh, companies or many companies, in fact, recognize that in fact that, that they have a body of experience with that, and in the right way, cognizant of of, of uh, information sharing and disclosure issues uh, about you know, costs in terms of what you disclose and what have you. Uh, the reality is, A, is, our contention is that investors and others will be wanting to see that information, and that indeed this ultimately will be valuable to companies, that is, uh, having outsiders looking in the appropriate kind of way, not in an intrusive way or in an inappropriate way, in, in a way we'll be able to test the merits of, in fact, uh, uh, their HR, their, their HR uh, strategies and policies in relationship to their own business strategy. So ultimately, I would think it's a plus for the companies, it'll be a plus for the investors, and with more disclosure, whether it be for academics or practitioners, there's an opportunity to do more meaningful analysis, which ultimately will benefit, I think, both companies and investors. Great. Well, thanks to you, gentlemen, for today's uh, information. It's been uh, very good content. Really appreciate it. Had a lot of good questions that came in. I think we, we're also seeing that more and more companies, as they move into the, their sustainability work, are realizing this is a, an opportunity to retain and attract new talent. Um, so it's something that companies should definitely put on their radar screen. I'm going to pass it back to Evan for the closing of today's webinar, the third in our series with NASDAQ. But also back to you, Evan, on you know what what is the takeaway that you're getting from us? Well, thanks, Mike. Thanks for your moderating, and thanks, Aaron and Larry, for participating. I think it's been a really enlightening discussion. I mean, the takeaway for me, as it has been in uh, previous webinars, is how much of a corporate outperformance indicator some of these kinds of areas are. Uh, and I'm convinced that uh, Aaron and Larry have demonstrated a link between outperformance in a lot of different areas and uh, more progressive or inclusive HR policies, policies that seem to make sense on a human level. And, uh, you know, it's the same thing that we've seen with environmental performance and resource management and, and social uh, measurement and performance and, and governance controls within corporations. NASDAQ is utterly convinced that these things are impactful on your bottom line. This is uh, risk mitigation to some extent and enterprise risk management, sure, but it's also revenue generating. And these are competitive differentiators that will help your company survive and outcompete. So um, that's the takeaway for me is that the more you are aware of these trends in the industry and the more things are changing, the more you can adopt and adapt for in-house purposes, uh, I think the better suited you will be to com compete and outperform in a sort of resource-constrained world. And resources in this sense are humans, human populations that, that are uh, looking for jobs. So uh, I will end it there. It's been a terrific discussion. I look forward to the next one with all of you. We will put one on the calendar soon. Thanks to everyone who participated, and uh, we'll call the meeting to a close.